If he were a riverboat gambler, we would say that he deals off the bottom of the deck. If he were a magician, we would say he has quite a gift at being sleight of hand. But that's not what the Bible calls him. The Bible calls Jacob a deceiver. This morning we are opening our Bibles to the book of Genesis. We'll camp out in chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32, a great story dealing with this wonderful Old Testament patriarch. Now wait a minute, Johnny. You just described this great Old Testament patriarch as a deceiver. Yes, I did. Because what this story is going to show us is a great example of a before and after picture. Before picture of Jacob and an after picture of Israel. And what an encounter with God can do to change the course of our lives. Great study in store for us. We will be in Genesis 32. I want us to back up to chapter 25 all the way to the birth of Jacob and his brother Esau because it tells us a lot about one conflict and how it grew, really where it began. In Genesis 25, Isaac prayed for his wife, Rebekah, because she was unable to, to bear children. The Lord answered that prayer. And Rebekah found out in chapter 25, beginning in verse 23, that not only was she going to be a mother, but she would be a mother of twins. So let's read that together. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's hill, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. There is something that I love about the Hebrew language. I know so little about it. I have to be honest with you on that. But I love the richness of their language and that their words, their names, so often have great meaning. We see several examples of that. The name Adam means man or mankind. Abraham means father of many. Isaac means he laughs. There's a great story about that in Genesis 18 and how he got his name. And then we come to Esau and Jacob. Esau means Harry, and again, from the very birth story, we understand how he received his name. Jacob means he grasped again going back to his very birth. Now, it goes a little deeper because the name Jacob also means he deceives. It's a Hebrew idiom that's used now. It's a word that's what it's used. It is connected with the idea of deception. And if Jacob means deceives and deception, he really lived up to his name. Author Max Licato talks about this deception and how um, Jacob deceived Esau and how he also deceived his father. Uh, let's just read this. He deceived Esau in order to climb the family tree. He once pulled the wool over his own eyes of his own father, a trick especially dirty since his father's eyes were rather dim, and this trick ensured him a gift he would have never received otherwise. He later conned his father-in-law out of his best livestock. And when no one else was looking, he took the kids and the cattle and skedaddled. <laughs> That's exactly what he did. Now, that covers stories from chapter 25 up to chapter 31. But there is a story. Before we get to chapter 32, I want us to, to look briefly at a story in Genesis 27. We've already seen from their birth when... Jacob grasped Esau's hill. We see something's going to be up. We also know that Jacob's name came to mean deceive. 
Genesis chapter 27 is an important story in that relationship. Isaac, in his older age, his eyes were dim, his body's weak, he knows his days are numbered, but he desired to bless his son Esau. Now, Esau was a, a hairy man, he liked nature, he liked outdoors, and Isaac said, Esau, I want you to, to go out and I want you to kill one of those good animals and I want you to prepare that just the way you do and let's share that together and I want to bless you. Jacob overheard that. And when Jacob found out about that, now his mother Rebekah was involved in this little scheme, Jacob deceived himself dressing up like his brother Esau. He prepared a meal, he came in and served it to his father. And then Isaac continued and he blessed his son, thinking he was blessing Esau, but he was actually blessing Jacob. It didn't take long for Esau and Isaac to understand the deception that had taken place. In chapter 27, verse 35, Scripture says, Your brother came deceitfully, and took your blessing. Esau said, isn't he rightly named Jacob? This is the second time he has taken advantage of me. Now, we remember this. He's rightly named Jacob because Jacob means he deceives. The first time that uh, Jacob deceived Esau was when Esau came in and he was famished and Jacob had some stew prepared. And Jacob said, I'll give you a bowl of this stew for your birthright. And so now, this was the second time the deception had taken place. Let's move on. He took my birthright, and now he's taken my blessing. Then he asked, Have you reserved any blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have made him lord over you, and have made all of his relatives his servants, and I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? This was a moment that was about to put a wedge in their relationship between Jacob and Esau. It is a wedge that would last for two decades. This is how tense that moment was. Chapter 27, verse 41. Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. He said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near and then I will kill my brother Jacob. When Rebekah was told what her older son Esau had said, she sent for her younger son Jacob and said to him, Your brother Esau is planning to avenge himself by killing you. Now then, my son, do what I say. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran. So now, even at this point, Jacob's deception, his deceptive practices... It's caused such a wedge in a relationship that now he's threatened and he has to run for his life. That's important. We don't really have a lot of time to devote to Jacob and Laban's relationship. Laban would eventually become Jacob's father-in-law. But let's just suffice it to say that deception and deception came together on this one. Jacob worked for seven years because he was in love with Rachel. But when the wedding took place and the ceremony had ended and Jacob pulled back the veil, there was Rachel's sister Leah. Laban had deceived Jacob. Jacob had to work another seven years in order to marry Rachel. Now, deception turned around where Jacob lived up to his name. And he had, there's a great story about livestock. And then you come to a point where Jacob took his family and his belongings and he left. As Max Licato says, he skedaddled. This is important because what we will see is after the deception is that there's a point, and it's in chapter 31, when Laban and Jacob made a covenant with one another. They had a frank, honest discussion in that chapter. But then they made a covenant with one another, and they parted in peace. Significant story. You have one conflict resolved, but there's still another one. That, well, it's, it's a big one, and it is coming over the horizon, literally. 
So what we have for the rest of our time together is we're going to see where Jacob wrestled with God and then we will know that Jacob made peace with Esau. An important lesson here is that if we want to be right with people, if we want to be at peace with people, then we first of all need to be right and at peace with God. Get that relationship right. The relationship with God and the relationship with people just falls in line. We're going to Genesis chapter 32, verse 6. Uh, Jacob had sent out some some men, and these messengers returned to Jacob. They said, we went to your brother Esau. Now he's coming to meet you. (laughs) And 400 men are with him. Esau at this point is coming to see his brother. Jacob, though, really doesn't know what to expect. Because Esau has had 20 years to stir that pot of anger, bitterness, and revenge. So what is this going to look like? How is this going to play out? Well, we see uh, Jacob's first response in verse 7. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups and the flocks and herds and camels as well. He thought, If Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. So Jacob divides up his his family and and his his livestock. He also, though, he took some livestock and other animals. He set those aside as a gift for his brother Esau. So we see that taking place. Everything else is sent away, leaving Jacob alone. That's important, seeing what's going to take place in the hours ahead. We come to Genesis chapter 32, verse 9, and I I don't want to make too much of this, but we have to say something about it. In Genesis chapter 32, verse 9, this is going to be the first occasion in Scripture where Jacob prayed to God. In fact... If you want to look before this, almost every story, everything that involved Jacob was negative. It was built around deceit and conflict. This is a moment. This prayer is significant because it brings Jacob in direct contact with God. And notice Jacob's attitude in prayer. Chapter 32, verse 9, Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me, and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sands of the sea, which cannot be counted. Do you notice Jacob's attitude? He realizes, this is a point in his life, he realizes he is unworthy of the kindness and faithfulness that has been shown to him. And I think if we ever want to come to a right relationship with God, wherever you may be, it may be at a point when you're struggling. If I could give you a great place to start, is to start by recognizing how great God is and to recognize our own sinfulness. We are unworthy. We are unworthy of God's goodness, His kindness, His faithfulness, His loving kindness. We're unworthy. We also see in this prayer that Jacob was concerned. The fear continues to come out in everything that Jacob is saying. He is really concerned with how this reunion, if you will, of how it's going to go. So we want to follow that. Chapter 32, verse 21, Jacob's gifts went on ahead of him. He himself spent the night in the camp. Family's gone, the gifts to Esau are gone, and Jacob is 
alone. Now, we need to notice that in this passage, we're going to come up on a word, Jabbok. Uh, Jabbok is going to be, uh, it's like a, a body of water that will flow off into the Jordan River. And that's where Jacob is going to be. Jabbok means flowing. It also means he wrestles. Now, author James Kaufman of the Kaufman Bible Commentaries says that he believes that that name, he wrestles, became associated with Jabbok really probably as a result of what took place in this story. Interesting idea, but we do know that Jabbok means he wrestles. Chapter 32, verses 24 through 30. Our key text of the day. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. This is an interesting story, this wrestling that takes place. If you look at the headings in many of our Bibles, it's going to say that Jacob wrestled with God. But I look at this, and... Jacob wrestled a man, was it an angel or was it God? And I will tell you this, that for all of that wrestling that took place, Jacob was also wrestling with himself. It was where his past came face to face with this contact with the Lord, also recognizing what lay ahead. So Jacob was at a point that, have you ever had it where your past kind of caught up with you? Uh, This is where Jacob is, except this is high octane. This is a significant moment. It is a tense moment. Jacob doesn't know what lies ahead. But he spent all night wrestling over this. A man, an angel, God, himself. I cannot stress this enough, and and I, I was tender about it when we got to the point of the prayer. In Genesis chapter 15, Scripture speaks of Abraham's righteousness. He believed and God credited it to him as righteousness. In Genesis 22, Abraham and Isaac are going up the mountain where Abraham is going to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. We read of their faith and their trust and their obedience to the Lord. Those are significant markers in the life of Abraham and in the life of Isaac. But up to this point in chapter 32 of the prayer and the moment of wrestling, we are hard-pressed to find any moment like this for Jacob where we would read that story and we'd go, that's a man of God right there. But even if we've struggled to find it up to this point, we're at that crossroads. And things changed here. Things changed when Israel left that place. He was a different man than he was when he came. Even more than just the new name, right? One more quote from author Max Licato. He says, On the banks of Jaddok, he rolled in the mud of his mistakes. I I like that. He He met God face to face sick of his past, in desperate need of a fresh start. And because Jacob wanted it so badly, God honored his determination. God gave him a new name and a new promise. But he also gave him, this is is wonderful, he gave him a wrenched hip as a reminder of that mysterious night on the river. 
Every time Israel walked in the future, he was reminded of that encounter with the Lord. He wore a new name. The name would have reminded of that, but this was, this was a true reminder. I, when we have those moments where we come in contact with the Lord, we have an encounter with God, uh, perhaps it's the time that you come and, and you want to be baptized into Christ. You want to recommit your life to Christ. I, I've got to tell you this. We need to remember those moments. We need to do something that we continually remember those moments. We go back to those. And we remember the commitment that we make on those occasions. Israel would forever remember this night. Jabbok means flowing and he wrestles, but here's a new name to add, Peniel. This is what Jacob, well now Israel, named the place. And he named it Peniel because it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. Isn't that beautiful? I saw God face to face. He, what that means, I think, and, and we could argue a lot of theology about this, but I'm going to tell you this. Jacob, Esau, understood the significance of the moment. That's key. He understood the changes that were taking place and that he was going to leave a different man than he was when he came. When we look at Jacob being changed to Israel, you know, uh, earlier there had been a lot of deceit and little mention of God. But in this moment... Remember, as, as Jacob prayed, he, he recognized his unworthiness, but he also recognized his fear. And God's strength was perfect for this moment. Jacob's stubborn will, which I think that's a, a name, that's a, a description we've not used yet, but it is very appropriate throughout Jacob's life up to this moment. His stubborn will was broken. And his example is worthy of our imitation. When we see who Jacob was and how this encounter with God changed his life and how he lived from this day forward, that's a life worth studying. That's a story worth studying. Because if God can make that change in Jacob, who became Israel and would be known as an Old Testament patriarch, then God can do the same for us. God can take our past, however spotted, however sinful it may be, and through the blood of Jesus, He can make us clean. We can be washed white as snow. And what does Scripture say? We are raised to walk a new life. His example is worthy of imitation. God's got to remind us of just a few things that are said in this story. In the prayer, Jacob said, I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I want to encourage us wherever we are in our walk with the Lord, but I'm especially thinking about those that are serious about coming to Christ or recommitting our lives to Christ. We begin by recognizing how great God is and how sinful we are. We approach God in humility. That's going to be a critical step. Then in chapter 32, verse 26, where Jacob replied, I will not let you go until you bless me. I, I love that picture. That I can see Jacob, and he is holding on for dear might. I'm not going to let go until you bless me. Jacob realized where he was. He recognized with whom he was. And he's saying, you've, you've got to bless me. I'm not going to let go. I'm holding on for that. I've got to encourage us in our walk with the Lord, in our walk with Jesus Christ. Understand that God wants to bless us. When we come to Christ and we become Christians, we believe, we confess, repent, and we're baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. We walk with the Lord. And from that moment, I've got to tell you, church, don't let go of Jesus. We fix our eyes on Him. We hold on to Him. He blesses our lives. In those times where moments get tough, we hold on tighter. We will not let go. We will not let go. And when we need to come back, when Jacob came back and he said, 
I'm not going to mess this up. I'm holding on until I receive that blessing. Jabbok means flowing, which became uh, significant because of the wrestling that took place there. Peniel is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. And then the word Israel. Israel has a couple of meanings to it as well. One is he struggles with God, which is what Israel did, what Jacob did. But it also means God prevails. God wins. And with, with Jacob now, with Israel, putting his faith in God, it put him in a position to be a blessed man. To be a father of a great nation, of, of those 12 tribes of Israel. What a great story. A great story of a man's past. What an encounter with God did for him. And how it changed his direction for the future. Our Lord wants to do the same with you. If you are not walking faithfully with the Lord, but you desire to, then come to Jesus, believe in Him. Confess Him as Lord and Savior. Repent of the sins in your life and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. I didn't make that up. I simply turned to New Testament Scripture in the book of Acts and I'm following the commands and the examples of Scripture of how people became Christians. I would also tell you if, if you have made that decision in your life, but right now it's, it's just not really where you are, and you know you need to come back. You want to recommit your life to the Lord. You want to rededicate yourself to service in the kingdom of God. And I want to encourage you, come back home and hold on tight. Come back in humility saying, God, I'm unworthy of your faithfulness and your love and your kindness and your forgiveness. But I'm going to hold on now. If we can help you in any way, I hope that you're going to reach out to us at Mall Road Church of Christ. Our phone number is 870-836-5038. That's 870-836-5038.